Speaking about the livestock sector, we have to think about very different systems and functions that livestock has in society. And on this left side, you have the highly selected commercial breeds that provide single products for a global market. And this is very schematic, but in this schematic, the livestock sector provides a contrib um, uh, has con seen considerable growth over the last 30 years with exceeding the growth in the crop sector with around 4% per year in production and 7% per year in value terms. And as the other extreme, you have multi-purpose breed and smallholder production systems which provide the livelihoods of 70% of the rural poor. Altogether, the livestock sector contributes more than 40% of the agricultural GDP at global level. As regards biodiversity at the species and breed level, we are dealing with less than 40 domesticated species, and we have hardly any wild species left. Within the agricultural sector, most food is produced by five species that have a global uh, spread, and at the breed level, we have an overall number today of about 8,000 breeds in our database. Most of them, as you can see, are mammalian, and um, the majority of these breeds are local breeds reported by single countries, and the red part are uh, transboundary breeds that are reported by various countries. Ecosystem services of livestock um, do exist, but the knowledge is usually at species level only, and this is a gap as we will see. There are some biological facts of livestock that determine the interaction of animals with other components of biodiversity, and the first one is that livestock is high on the food chain, and therefore there are conversion losses. This means that the livestock sector overall occupies about one-third of the global um, land area for feeding, and this land um, extent also um, leads to WWF and IUCN stating that livestock sector contributes to the loss of biodiversity at habitat and species level. The next important point is that livestock is closely related to humans, and 70% of the diseases of humans stem from the animal kingdom. That means the way we manage our livestock sector and we deal with the ecosystem around it influences the ecosystem's ability to provide human health services. And lastly, life, livestock are mobile. Looking a bit more in detail in, in the um, ecosystem services, livestock supports crop agriculture for, uh, from field preparation to post-harvest transport in many developing countries. It provides nutrient cycling across landscapes with grazing in one part and depositing manure in other parts of the landscape and creating spots of soil fertility and spatial heterogeneity that are um, interesting and important for fl flora and fauna. They recycle all kinds of waste and transform them into milk, uh, into products, but also in fuel and manure. A lot of plant seeds need scarification through passage of the digestive tract of animals to be able to germinate. And another function is that the coats of animals transport seeds through landscapes and thereby connect lands, um, the, the genetics across landscapes. Regulating services are mostly related to well-managed grazing lands where livestock maintain structural heterogeneity of vegetation, contribute to shrub and fire control, 
increase soil organic matter and can contribute to carbon sequestration and have a positive effect of water cycles. And that means also that local breeds get recognized of part of, as, as an important part of culture and landscapes and attractive for, for tourism and for citizens. And then there is a wide range of cultural services provided by livestock. The main threats to breed diversity are related to economic and market drivers and to those structural changes that are related with the economic transition of agriculture. The second important group of factors is related to poor livestock sector policies that are not in favor of small-scale farming and biodiversity. And a last group of factors is related to institutional weaknesses and instabilities. But the dominance of economic and market drivers um, means that with regard to the current risk status, we have experienced the biggest losses in those areas where structural change in agriculture has been fastest, which is Europe and North America. Currently, we have 8% of the breeds at global level as mentioned as extinct, and 22% are currently at risk. For another 34%, we have no idea about the population status because we have no population figures. To taking again this economic approach um, on sustainability, you can see on this graph as the GDP per capita increases, the, there is usually an increase in meat consumption that plateaus off at a GDP of about $30,000 per capita. And in parallel, across a 110 country study, you can see that the share of breeds extinct and at risk in the total breeds is steeply um, increasing. As countries get richer, they invest more in characterization and in um, inventories of breeds. And the, cur the blue curve shows that the breed with unknown risk status declines. And only when countries get even more richer, you can see that the share of breeds at risk that are put in conservation program increases. But there is about a $20,000 gap in the GDP between these two events. Therefore, the goal should be to bring down the red curve, the risk curve altogether, and to lift the green uh, conservation curve to the left of the economic development so that conservation measures in C2 and ex C2 take place much earlier in economic development to avoid the loss of diversity. Coming to information gaps and sticking to this very schematic uh, system, we have very different information gaps in locally adapted and highly selected commercial breeds. For the locally adapted, we are missing most information on population size, structure, spatial distribution. We have little information about their phenotypes or performance traits, the genetic and molecular characterization and the economic value that they provide to, to their keepers. There are hardly any genetic improvement programs, particularly in developing countries. And related to ecosystem services, there is a serious lack of hard data on the interaction of livestock with their environment. As regards the highly selected commercial breeds, we know that within breed diversity has been narrowing but we don't know the impact of this on future food security. We have had tremendous genetic gains of more than 1% a year over the last 50 years that may raise question on physiological limits, but so far we don't know whether there are physiological limits, where they are, and how production and health do interact. And as a societal con uh, discussion about uh, the environmental footprint of livestock production continues, we have to seriously think about the reconciliation 
of high production with animal welfare and environmental issues. The future challenges lie in the fields of omics, which is all the genomics, metagenomics, the phenomics, big um, data uh, generated through modern genetic technologies and the related issues in data processing and bioinformatics. How can we make these useful for local breeds in developing countries? This is a big challenge. Reproductive technologies and conservation technologies are closely related. There is a lot of technology out there, but again, in developing countries, some cases, even artificial insemination is not working. And without functioning uh, cryo programs, you cannot do cryo conservation programs. The safety and health status of conserved material is another issue of concern. I spoke a lot about the linking between genotypes and production environments. There we need to decide, location specific, whether we optimize the genotype or the environment and adapt the other component to what we cannot change. Related to the um, environmental footprint of livestock production, there is now an emerging um, issue of either feed um, resources or animals being genetically modified to increase resource efficiency, for example, phytase uptake, and this causes, uh, depending on the point of view, ethical, legal, and societal concerns. The sustainable use and development of the livestock sector does depend on the way we manage breeding programs, but also on the role livestock plays in society and the discussion we are having here, what type of livestock production, what type of size, intensity, spatial heterogeneity do we want to have, what is our goal. And that brings us to a broader view on adaptation, not only looking at adaptation, how can we adapt the animal to climate change, um, but to look at adaptation in a broader ecological and evolutionary terms, which includes, for example, the host pathogen interface or the rumen microbiota, and how do they react in different ecosystems. And then, lastly, the application of the ecosystems approach and with animals higher up on the food chain, where do we cut systems boundaries depending on the environmental, social or economic good that we want to optimize. Thank you for your attention.